Welcome to the spookiest, the most over the top 2022 NFL mock draft on YouTube. I'm pretty excited for this one. Here we go, get your popcorn ready. Hello darkness, my old friend. And how's this for your trick or treat? The trick is that I thought I was safe projecting a mock draft trade in October. The original version of this mock draft featured the Eagles using two of their current first rounders to get Deshaun Watson. The treat would be that a three-way trade involving Deshaun Watson and Tua Tonga Bailoa has presented itself, which never happens in the NFL. But yeah, I scrapped the Eagles version of this. This is an updated version based around the rumors claiming that a deal could get done with the Dolphins within the week. I'll touch more on that when we get to those teams picks, but the order of this mock draft is based on my current projections for how the season will play out. I went through every single game for the rest of the season and this is the order I came up with. I apologize if you don't like it but I'm not a big fan of using the current order because you can't just say that a team won five games in the first half of the season so they're gonna win five games again in the second half and Vegas odds are set up to entice you to bet on the teams that look good right now. But go ahead let me have it in the comments if you don't like where your team is picking. I'm in the 99th percentile of ESPN's picks can pick them so come at me bro. But the draft order is not what October mock drafts are for. They are for fun first and foremost but also bringing attention to potential draft prospects so you can still get a chance to watch them in live games. Also, this is around the time that a top quarterback prospect starts to separate themselves from the crowd. Last year it was Wilson and Joe Burrow the year before that. But no more spoilers because the rumors out of Houston already ruined the surprise of this mock draft. So let's just jump right into it. All right, at number one, we have got the New York Jets. And this number one overall pick may be decided in week 12 when the Jets travel to Houston. I've got the Texans taking that one because Rod Taylor will likely be back by then. And hopefully the Jets have learned their lesson after beating the Rams last year. So then when the Jaguars come to town in week 16, they can lose accordingly. The Jets have a ton of needs. And for now, quarterback ain't one, which is a good thing because this is a terrible year to need one as the top quarterbacks are definitely not going to appeal to the old school guys and girls out there. After taking a quarterback in his first season as head coach, I think that Robert Salah is going to get the say on this pick but really regardless of who ends up with the first overall pick this one feels like a lock already to be Oregon's edge rusher Kayvon Thibodeau even without much 2021 impact he's the best player in the draft with the highest positional value by the way if you're still here you've made it through all the weird Halloween stuff and you are watching a mock draft in October then you are my kind of people I hope you'll stick around after this do me a favor hit the like button subscribe and uh, YouTube hates me so you're gonna have to hit the bell notification so that you get notified when my videos drop let's move on at number two, we've got the Houston Texans, and honestly, no team needs to lose out and get the number one overall pick quite as badly as the Texans so that they can lock up the best pass rusher in the class. In a move that was overshadowed by the rumors surrounding Deshaun Watson, the Texans mercifully released Whitney Merciless, pun intended, because, well, they aren't going anywhere anytime soon, and they knew that he'd be able to latch on with a Super Bowl team and quickly sign with the Packers. I just don't see them staying this bad once Tyrod gets back and with such winnable games against the Jets and Jaguars still in the schedule. Now, a lot of people are using the Texans to pencil in their number one quarter quarterback, whoever that may be, but this team's been brutally depleted of their talent level, and depending on what they do with Deshaun Watson, either before the trade deadline or if they have to wait until next offseason, a lot of the teams that are interested in him have another quarterback that they would likely be sending to the Texans in exchange or trying to finagle a three-way trade like the Dolphins are trying to do with the Washington football team currently, reportedly. Now, I don't understand why you would make a move for Deshaun Watson right now unless you knew that he was going to be able to play the full extent of the season, but that won't be the Texans' problems once they move him. I just think that there are a lot better options than drafting a Daniel Jones or a Dwayne Haskins in the first round this year. So I have the Texans drafting the best player available. And this is going to sound crazy, but I truly believe he is the second best player available in the draft class. And hey, if the Falcons can take a tight end at number four, why can't the Texans take a generational defensive back at number two? Kyle Hamilton is this year's unicorn that everyone is going to fall in love with. He is built like Isaiah Simmons, except he's even better in coverage with range like Ed Reed. If Derek Stingley was able to follow up his freshman season with a similar performance I think that he would be the pick here because the positional value of a cornerback is much greater than a safety but Kyle Hamilton just feels like more of a program building block whereas Stingley I don't know he could be one of those guys that's just always hurt when the squad isn't playing well I just I wanted to see it again at number three, we've got the Jacksonville Jaguars, and this one is easy. They've got to build a better and more consistent offensive line around Trevor Lawrence. Cam Robinson is one of the most overpaid offensive tackles in the league and will probably be replaced by the next great Alabama offensive lineman in Evan Neal. Evan Neal is a way better athlete than Cam Robinson ever was, yet he still possesses that similar mammoth frame. And now the Jaguars have the two most important positions on offense locked down for the next decade. 
At number four, we've got the Detroit Lions, and their list of team needs looks like a fantasy football lineup right before the draft starts. They essentially just need to take the best players available regardless of position. Their defensive coordinator, Aaron Glenn, is a former NFL defensive back, and he was that small, overachieving nickel cornerback type. I'm sure that he would love to get a corner with the natural physical gifts like Derek Stingley. This guy had one of the best freshman years that you'll ever see from a player at any position, but we've just seen it in flashes ever since. That lack of consistency does raise some red flags for me, but I don't feel like there's many other people out there that are concerned with that, so maybe I'm making a big deal out of a little deal here. Real quick, before we dive too deep into this mock draft, let me take a moment to tell you about the sponsor of this mock draft, MyBookie. I've lost track of all the new betting sites that have started up this year, but MyBookie has been here and been doing this for a few years now as a sponsor of this channel. So they're literally years ahead in development and offering different ways to play. They've also got these NFL super contests where you pick five games against the spread. Your scores can accumulate over a four week period. There is a $100 buy and it's a little steep, but the payouts are sweet. I went with $10 because it's an awesome way to get your feet wet, especially because it feels as unpredictable predictable as ever. You can use my promo code NFLRT and my bookie will match your first deposit up to a thousand dollars. So basically you can double your money before you even make a bet. You've had enough sample size of the season to make an educated prediction. These guys are literally giving you free money to bet with. And if you've been following my weekly pick'em series, you've probably been cleaning up. Big thanks to my bookie for sponsoring this. Let's get back to the mock draft. At number five, we've got the New York football giants and their coaching staff might have it a complete overhaul. Even Dave Gettleman might get the boot, but I'm going to make these picks based on the idea that the schemes will all remain the same. The giants could take the first quarterback off the board, sure, but Daniel Jones has got one more year left on his deal before he has to decide on the fifth year option. And maybe with a new fresh coaching staff, he could finally have a full breakout season. And I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for the fact that they're in New York, the giants would be all in on Deshaun Watson, but I know that they're afraid of the media. there, ripping them apart. If even one of these allegations turns out to be true so yeah anyways the Giants have already heavily invested along their defensive front but Texas A&M's DeMarvin Leal is too good of a defensive lineman to pass up right now now I don't know why Dexter Lawrence isn't playing at the nose for them but drafting DeMarvin Leal would force him inside while Leonard Williams and Leal would round out an entire first round defensive front at number six, we've got the Eagles with the first of three first round picks. And all three of them are projected to be in the top 15. And that's being conservative. They might end up all in the top 10. And this is why my first version of this mock draft was gonna have them making the trade for Deshaun Watson. And if this all ends up being just smoke screens out of Houston, then maybe I will revisit this scenario after the November 2nd trade deadline. And it's highly likely that it is. Sit tight with me for a minute. Let me frame this for you. My wife and I, we tried jumping into the crazy real estate market this summer, right? We found a really nice house that was in the process of being built. When we went to put an offer on the house they said that they had like four other people that called that day and that if we wanted it we needed to come down within the next hour or two and sign an official offer we're not the type to just impulsively decide on something as life-changing as a house like that so we passed right that house remained on the market for like two or three more months why am i telling you this well it's not really a secret around this channel i'm not a big fan of the texans gm i think that he's a used car salesman i still believe that there is a possibility these allegations are a result of his nefarious actions behind the scenes and i believe that they're might be interest from the Dolphins, but he's just trying to create urgency with the trade deadline less than two weeks away. I wouldn't be shocked if it was the Eagles he was trying to light a fire under because they have the better draft capital and it wouldn't rely on a third team complicating things with extra assets. So assuming the Eagles keep all of their first rounders, keep in mind if they let Deshaun Watson go to the Dolphins, their pick probably won't be as early of a pick, but I think that the Eagles still find a way to make a move at quarterback because I don't see them going through this process of drafting another quarterback again in the first round, even with three first rounders. However, I just I don't see them putting their feet up with Jalen Hurts as the starter beyond this season and they will likely be in on the quarterback shuffle that's going to take place this offseason so maybe they add three new starters in April's draft or maybe they send one of them to Green Bay or Seattle for their quarterback but they've got to do something to try and make everyone forget that they went from Wentz to Foles to Super Bowl champions back to Wentz and then to Jalen Hurts it's becoming increasingly clear that Jalen Hurts has got a long way to go to become a top tier starter in the NFL however I am a little bit shocked that people are ready to just give up on him already I mean it's his first first full year as a starter and people don't think that erratic accuracy can get better I mean to be fair I guess it did get worse with Carson Wentz so maybe Eagles fans are just hurt themselves and subconsciously they don't want to be triggered by their quarterback's last name but this Eagles roster is actually pretty solid other than linebacker but if Howie Roseman is going to pretend like he doesn't seen that hole there for the last few years then so am I so long story short no Deshaun Watson for you and we're looking at positional value first and foremost Derek Barnett never really reached his full potential and his contract expires after this year Brandon Graham is also entering the final 
final year of his deal next year. So they're going to need to find a running mate to pair with Josh Sweat. Man, Josh Sweat was such a fun prospect out of FSU. He had those injuries concerns, but seems to have overcome them after a few years. Now, if only they could be that patient with their quarterback, right? Michigan's Aiden Hutchinson is a perfect complement to Sweat. He's got the size, run stopping ability to offset Josh Sweat, being kind of a liability in the running game. But while not quite offering the same dynamic speed rush that Josh Sweat does, I just said Sweat so many times, this feels like an old spice ad. At number seven, we've got the New York Giants back on the clock with the first round pick that they got for trading up for Justin Fields. You know, I think that there's this unspoken competition between the Giants and Vikings to see who can waste the most first round picks on cornerbacks. I mean, seriously, they've had some terrible luck when it comes to guys like Eli Apple, DeAndre Baker, Prince Mukamara was okay. Even Sam Beal has been a disappointment and he was just a third rounder in the supplemental draft. Last year, James Bradbury was a crucial free agent signing and has given the Giants really good value, but he's come back to down to earth a little bit in the second season with the team. I'm going to use this pick from the Bears and the Justin Fields trade to address it once and for all, or, you know, at least for the next few years. Andrew Booth Jr. is the latest defensive back to come out of Clemson. And even though the program is in a down year, he has been a battle-tested corner over his college career. He's got everything you look for with the length, the speed, twitchiness, and could end up being the cornerback one for many teams. At number eight, we've got the Texans back on the clock. So the Texans, they got this pick from the Dolphins. Dolphins, they got this pick from Washington in exchange for Tua Tungavailoa, as well as a much needed distraction from Bruce Allen's email scandals. The Texans added the best defensive back in the class at number two. Now they have their pick of the wide receivers to replace DeAndre Hopkins. However, they're just not set up for a luxury pick at wide receiver right now. No quarterback is going to be effective behind the current and future projected state of this offensive line. Justin Brittle is gone after this year and you basically can't trust any offensive lineman that Bill O'Brien drafted. There all busts. Maybe this was part of his attempt to get fired at the end there, but whatever it is, we've got to make the not sexy pick. And Kenyon Green might be the best overall offensive lineman in this draft class, but because he's got kind of tweenerisms about him, he's automatically relegated to 1B because Evan Neal, he's got that Alabama pedigree attached to his name, and he plays a more premier position. Kenyon Green has played left tackle for the Aggies in a pinch, and I believe he could do it full time, but put Kenyon Green at right guard, and you've got some talent distribution with Laramie Tunsil at left tackle. That way, whoever you get to fill in the other three spots won't be trapped by a bum on both sides of them. I still think back to how Quentin Nelson transformed the Colts offensive line from one of the worst to one of the best. At number nine, we've got the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Steelers have not been drafting this high in a long time. And that's because they are a smart, progressive franchise that makes good long-term franchise decisions. With that said, I could see them following Ben Roethlisberger up with another small school quarterback prospect that is suited for the next generation of football. Liberty's quarterback, Malik Willis, is the number one QB for me, and not because he's a local prospect, but he is dynamic, offers a skill set that's primed to take advantage of tomorrow's NFL. My only hesitation here is the Steelers offensive line is still in shambles, and hopefully they would allow Mason Rudolph for Dwayne Haskins to take the lumps early on in 2022 until they're sure that Willis won't get this welcome to the NFL Justin Fields style of treatment. At number 10, the Falcon Super Bowl window has officially closed, and it's time to get some value out of Matt Ryan, kind of like the Lions did with Matthew Stafford. Matt Ryan's contract shoots up to $48 million cap hit next year, so unless he takes a pay cut, it's time to send him to a team that thinks that they're only a quarterback away. And I don't love the quarterbacks in this draft class, and still would have drafted Justin Fields over a tight end last year, even though I was a huge fan of Kyle Pitts. It was just pretty clear that Justin Fields could have benefited from some seasoning. He was a local kid, and the writing has been on the wall with this Matt Ryan contract. It's not like it came out of nowhere. And now you've got a weak roster with a weak offensive line and a very expensive quarterback. And I've mentioned that quarterback shuffle that's going to take place this offseason. You're not going to attract the many veteran quarterbacks. So maybe a Matt Ryan pay cut is your best option because, you know, you got to stay face, appear competitive and keep that new stadium full, right? But maybe Falcons GM Terry Fonda can give the Falcons fans a second chance at that Michael Vick experience with Malik Willis. But after passing on Justin Fields, I'm not sure if he's going to want to take the risk on a small school quarterback in his second year as GM. So instead of trying to place the number seven experience with another number seven. How about we replace number two with a new number two. Matt Corral could be the Joe Burrow, Zach Wilson type of fast riser this year. I haven't watched enough of him to make that call like that just yet, but the tools are there for sure. Matt Ryan has never had the strongest arm, so that's got to be a very attractive aspect of Corral's game. I know that Calvin Ridley would be a lot more effective as a nice deep threat if he was paired with an arm like Corral's, but the really intriguing part of his game is that he offers way more flash with his legs than Matt Frozen and Ice ever could. Now, it's no Mike Vick experience because that might be a once in a lifetime kind of thrill, but he's mobile enough to maybe help you hide some of the deficiencies in this offensive line. Given you came out to a lot of booze, what sort of gives you comfort and calm when you come out to that kind of reception? Uh, Matt Corral. 
All right, we're out of the top 10. Let's speed this up a little bit. We've got the Patriots on the clock here at number 11, and their defense is struggling like we haven't seen in a while. They lack the pass rush to really get back to being anywhere where they were. And every year there's a prospect that just kind of looks like a Belichick kind of guy, you know, the versatile overachiever types. Last year, it was Micah Parsons just because he's a freak. It was Zach Bond the year before that. Well, Purdue's George Karloftis is the Belichickian player of the draft so far. This guy is mean, got a nonstop motor, but I won't get too deep into him because I'm sure that I'll be mocking George Karloftis to the Patriots many times until April gets here. At number 12, we've got the Minnesota Vikings. And I mentioned their curse of the cornerback earlier, but they need a cornerback. So I'm gonna take a cornerback, right? If you wanna know how to troll a Vikings fan, tell them that they need to draft a first round cornerback. Honestly though, I get it. It's starting to feel like it is a curse scenario for the Vikings. One that only rivals asking their kicker to make a clutch field goal. But as Greg Joseph proved, even a blind squirrel can find a nut sometimes. But I've heard you though, I respect your request to not take a cornerback because not only have you guys asked for it in the past, but because there is enough substantial evidence from their history that should make anyone want to avoid taking a corner in the first round. That's why they went and spent money on Patrick Peterson this offseason. So what is the next best position to address that can indirectly help your secondary? Pass rush. Everson Griffin has been great in his return from his D-Town tours, but can't go on forever. He'll probably be resigned to a team-friendly one or two-year deal since he obviously can't thrive in anything other than purple, but you've only got unproven prospects after him. So if George Karloftis makes it past the Patriots, he would be the pick here, but I'm going to go with my Jai Sanders. He offers a lean, bendy athleticism off the edge that all the kids are looking for these days. Days. At number 13, we've got the Eagles back on the clock. This is their pick from the Dolphins, and I've got them taking the guy that the Vikings probably should have taken, and that's Florida's cornerback, Kyir Elam. It is a copycat league, and Trayvon Diggs is going to get the NFL GMs all anxious to find their own version of this long, athletic cornerback. Kyir Elam possesses very similar coveted traits. Elam also has NFL genetics, even if his uncle's career didn't pan out as well as expected. While I was researching the Elam fam, I decided to see what old Matt Elam is doing these days after he was a first rounder for the Ravens in 2013. And guess what? He is playing playing for the Tuscan Sugar Skulls of the Indoor Football League. Yeah, this is my first time learning of a team called the Sugar Skulls too. At number 14, we've got the Denver Broncos. And uh, quick detour real quick, I'm thinking about doing a free agent prediction video, but like a really, really early version of it, like free agent mocks. Mostly because it's all centered around the Broncos becoming the halfway house for quarterbacks nearing retirement. Obviously the favorite for that this offseason is going to be Aaron Rodgers, but maybe it is Matt Ryan. Maybe it's Russell Wilson as a consolation prize. Maybe they don't want to deal with Aaron Rodgers. He can be so dramatic, so maybe he's not worth a headache, but if he can be more petty on the field like he was against the Bears and a little bit more relaxed off the field, and sign me up for him following in Peyton Manning's footsteps. I can't wait to fast forward to 2025 when Aaron Rodgers is hosting a much more dysfunctional version of Monday Night Football with his brother, and it'll probably be presented by State Farm. So anyways, back to the Broncos. Their current quarterback situation is not going to get them anywhere they want to be. The roster is only a few pieces away from being a relatively similar situation to the one that Peyton Manning walked into. And even though Rodgers, Russell, Ryan, all three of them are not quite as close to being washed as Peyton Manning was, I still think that they should address this offensive line. Darian Kennard out of Kentucky is as versatile as they come despite his massive size saying that he is a guard at the next level he's almost played exclusively at right tackle for them but this flex could give the broncos a lot of options to get their best five starters out there because i actually really liked some of the recent prospects that they've drafted like lloyd cushenberry natane muti dalton reisner and even quinn myers i'm not ready to give up on them yet because you know maybe offensive linemen just take longer to develop up in that denver altitude kind of like garrett bowles did but canard could come in and give you a mauler at right tackle because none of those guys are nfl tackles and bobby massey is easily the weak link of this unit. Jeez, everywhere you turn, the Eagles have another pick in this mock draft. At number 15, they are on the clock. This time, it's conditionally from the Colts. And by conditionally, I mean that if Carson Wentz doesn't miss a majority of the remainder of the season, it will be a first round pick. I believe Wentz must play in 75% of the offensive snaps. I think that's the threshold. 70% if they make the playoffs. Just check it out. Otherwise, it turns back into a pumpkin at midnight. That's why I was so confused when the Colts rushed Carson Wentz back from that broken foot. They could have put Wentz on IR for the first one. Compensation would have become a second round pick instead of a first. And nobody would have batted an eye but but anyways i'm sorry i held out for a few more picks but if the eagles keep three first round picks they have to take an early linebacker at some point right get yourself the nick saban approved linebacker counterpart to your quarterback christian harris is more athletic than most of the linebackers that we've seen coming out of alabama and you know he got a master's in defense he would fit this defense like eric kendricks from day one but please tell me again how howie roseman just doesn't value one of the most important parts of the defense
At number 16, we've got the Panthers, and unless they step up as players in this veteran quarterback shakeup that we could have this offseason, then the Panthers are probably on the hook for Sam Darnold and his $20 million contract. He has been up and down in the first half of the season, but without Christian McCaffrey, this offensive line was exposed. The Panthers have had a revolving door at left tackle since 2014, basically when the legend of Jordan Gross retired, and I think that trend continues at one more year because they need better than Cam Irving. Charles Cross is a left tackle at Mississippi State, and he plays with a nastiness. However, he is only a redshirt sophomore, so there's a chance he doesn't declare, but this draft seems to be quite heavy in offensive linemen, and I think that's where the focus has got to be for the Panthers. At number 17, we've got the Texans on the clock again. This one coming from the Dolphins, which they got from the 49ers in their original trade down in the 2021 NFL Draft. I mentioned that Whitney Merciless release earlier on, which opens up a huge need for edge rusher. After they released him, Lovey Smith said that he is looking for an edge better suited for his Tampa 2 scheme. When I hear about a Tampa 2 edge, I instantly think of Simeon Rice. That dude had arms like a mutant human tarantula, and he was lightning quick too. USC's edge rusher, Drake Jackson, has the frame for it, but man his body is so thin and wiry still he called this season his quote-unquote money season when this dude probably should have been more focused on hitting leg day at number 18, we've got the Las Vegas Raiders, and this team could see a lot of turnover after the John Gruden mini drama series was released on NFL Plus. When I was trying to project the Raiders' future moves in free agency, I was happy to go with the breadcrumbs that Devontae Adams left us by entertaining the idea of him joining his college quarterback. Otherwise, here I would give the Raiders the best route runner in the class, Chris Olave. And even though they already had a lot of turnover along the offensive line in the previous offseason, it's becoming increasingly clear to everyone that Derek Carr needs an elite level of protection and or a highly effective rushing attack. Thanks again for that scouting report, Joey Bosa. And if I'm being honest, I did so many of these mock drafts and write-ups that I was so excited to see Tyler Linderbaum still on the board for the Raiders. He is the perfect Raider. And as a center, you know what that means. Linderbaum is going to be one of those tone setters along the offensive line. He's going to make everybody on this offense a little bit better. He actually came to Iowa as a defensive tackle. So that should explain where he gets the violent streak from. But this would be a great move for the Raiders to start rebuilding a foundation from the ground level up. And for the job that Tom Cable has done with the injuries in the last couple seasons, Seasons, assuming that he's brought back, I think that he has earned the right to work with a little bit more blue chip talent. All right, so we are now at number 19. These are all playoff teams from here on out. And the order of these teams are not based on what I think will happen in the playoffs. Once I hit the playoffs with these predictions, I just go ahead and go with the top seed, winning each playoff matchup. And I'm only telling you this because I'm trying to convince the uh, naysayers that this is a better and more efficient process. It does take a little bit more time though, which is why a lot of people don't like to do it. But I think this is the best way to project roughly where a team is going to be picking. You probably end up seeing more movement as far as where the players are ranked than you'll see movement from where these teams are slotted to be picked. And at 19, we've got the Cincinnati Bengals. And the same thing for the Bengals is with the Raiders and a lot of these other young quarterbacks. You've got to protect Joe Burrow at all costs. He's come out firing in his sophomore season now that he's been reunited with Jamar Chase, but I can't help but still cringe every time I see him take a big hit. Ohio State's Nicholas Petit Frere is from just down the road from Cincinnati. You know, I'm sure that Urban Meyer could just give him directions. He is a legit left tackle. And even though Jonah Williams has been playing some of his best ball as a pro, he's only got one more year left on his deal. And I'm still convinced he could be even better if you kicked him inside to guard or even as a right tackle. Either way, NPF could play right tackle as a rookie, prep for the left tackle after Jonah Williams gets paid top guard money in free agency from a front office that sees his inside potential. I know Bengals fans probably don't want to see their top offensive linemen walk away when the position has been such a need for so long, but this is a cheap front office. I'm sure you guys know that. And letting Jonah Williams walk in free agency would easily net them a third round compensatory pick, assuming that the rest of their free agency was managed properly to avoid offsetting his loss with another signing. It's, it's kind of complicated, but all the NFL GMs know how to do it. It's just whether or not they want to do it. At number 20, we've got the New York Jets. After getting the best player in the draft, the Jets could go a number of directions with this bonus pick from the Jamal Adams trade. When Robert Salah had the 49ers defense at his best, it was because Fred Warner was holding down the middle of it. Then one of the first guys that they signed in free agency was Jared Davis. He hasn't even seen the field yet due to an ankle injury, but we saw enough of him in Detroit. And CJ Mosley, he's been a shell of himself after opting out for 2020. Maybe he shakes the rust at some point, maybe not. And maybe it's a Mountain West thing, but this dude from Utah, Devin Lloyd, he puts off mad Fred Warner vibes. He is a converted wide receiver, dropped the number 20 this year, and is now rocking the number zero jersey, looking like a bona fide stud, sideline to sideline, three down, middle linebacker. I think that Utah has him rushing the passer a lot out of need, and he does offer something blitzing off the edge because he's so athletic, but he is best suited to play linebacker at the next level, and he is kind of reckless as a tackler, but for an ex-wide receiver that's still learning the position, I think he's got a lot of room to grow, and it's definitely not an effort issue. It's just a technique thing. 
At number 20, we've got the Cleveland Browns. Honestly, they don't have a lot of holes. They might need a guard if Wyatt Teller leaves in free agency, but that's about it. But y'all don't want me drafting another interior offensive line in the first round though, right? So let's shake it up here. I think that this is the off season where Odell Beckham Jr. finally gets traded. Guy looks miserable out there. And I'll never forget that he said he thought he was sent to Cleveland to die. You don't just shake that thought process without having some legitimate success to prove you otherwise. And then you've got Baker Mayfield getting knocked out of games here with a shoulder injury. And that's after Baker had a case of the yips every time he targeted OBJ. Now the poor guy's gonna have to play with Case Keenum. Hell, Keenum might actually be better suited to force feed his best wide receiver than Baker is. Ask DeAndre Hopkins. And even after they would trade Odell Beckham Jr., I don't even think that the Browns would need a wide receiver that badly, but both of these Ohio State wide receivers still on the board, I gotta take one. Chris Olave is the safest bet as an NFL receiver because his route running should translate to really quick success. And he could have a Justin Jefferson impact early on in the right situation. At number 22, we've got the New Orleans Saints and they are getting close to a Michael Thomas divorce. I'm still unsure how we even got to this point other than him being a selfish diva, but they already had a need at wide receiver too with him on the roster. And Jameis Winston hasn't had a full complement of wide receivers to throw to all year. And this is actually becoming my favorite landing spot for Russell Wilson. While his finger recovers, he's getting to see the Seahawks coaching staff in action from a sideline view. And I don't think that he's gonna enjoy the lack of creativity that he sees from them. On top of the fact that he already had a foot halfway out the door this off season. The Seahawks might not want to trade him within the NFC, but man, Sean Payton and Russell Wilson could be a dream pairing. Either way, the Saints team is looking at a hole at wide receiver because assuming Michael Thomas gets traded, only Marquez Galloway and Traquan Smith are under contract beyond this year. And you guys know how Sean Payton likes his big boys at wide receiver. Drake London is one of the guys that intrigues me the most from this wide receiver class because of his frame. And yes, there are two prospects from USC named Drake. Drake Jackson is an edge rusher and Drake London is a wide receiver, but don't tell Drake Jackson I told you this, but he and Drake London are almost built the same. And that's more of a compliment to Drake London because they don't make wide receivers this size very often, unless you're in Green Bay. And I keep waiting for one that has the athleticism to match the size. Otherwise, at 6'5", they typically have a hard time getting separation from NFL defensive backs. And it takes a guy like Aaron Rodgers to trust their arm enough to be able to pinpoint the ball in a spot where their big guy can make a play on it and the shorter cornerbacks can't. I think that the sweet spot for wide receivers is about 6'3", 220, like a Julio Jones, DK Metcalf build. It's still hard to find guys that size with that S to your speed. It seems like the taller you get, the more rare it becomes. That's why Calvin Johnson was Megatron. He was unique. But going back to these Green Bay wide receivers, I was obsessed with Alan Lazard coming out of Iowa State. I'm pretty sure that there's a mock somewhere on this channel that had him in the first round and he ended up going undrafted. He is six foot five and I thought that he had it all. I also liked Equinemia St. Brown, but not nearly as much. He was too thin and lanky and struggled with the physicality at the NFL level. He actually might've been just a few years early because that big slot wide receiver is the thing now instead of pegging the big guys as strictly outside receivers. Anyways, Drake London, he kind of reminds me of Equinemia St. Brown, but with much better hands and a little bit thicker. But if he pans out in the NFL, it will be because of those mitts. At number 23, we've got the Lions, and here comes the run on wide receivers. They are such good value in this range of the draft, and comparatively, I just don't see one that has risen to the top just yet, but it's pretty clear that this Lions wide receiver group is glaringly tragic. I know that uh, Jared Goof, I mean Goff, my bad, I'm always doing that. Goff probably had a better wide receiver core at a cow, honestly. The Lions went from Megatron to baby Megatron to Amon Ra St. Brown, and yes, he and Equinemius are brothers. They've got a third one at Stanford too. He might be the best one of the three. But Traylon Burks is a big meaty wide receiver seriously he is a thick dude if you look at his measurements he's right at that prototype threshold that I was talking about and I haven't done a deep dive enough into these wide receivers but initial impressions are that Traylon Burks might be the best of the bunch if he tests well athletically this guy might mess around and become the wide receiver one in this class for me at number 24, we've got the Los Angeles Chargers. It's funny how once you get a franchise quarterback, all of a sudden your team looks stacked. However, it's been easy to see that the Chargers biggest hole in the 2021 season has been stopping the running game. They've been using a rotation consisting of Jerry Tillery, Christian Covington, Linval Joseph, but it's just not working. They spent a first rounder on Tillery in 2019, but that was to be more of a pass rushing defensive tackle as a three technique. He's been a massive bust either way thus far, but he is still under contract. Christian Covington and Linval Joseph both have expiring contracts and they've been playing the one tech role in this defense. Their main responsibility is just stopping the run. That's it. Other than that, I love what Brandon Staley is doing defensively. I think he's a brilliant football mind. And this might be somewhat of a luxury pick, but I think this defense is missing a true nose tackle. Jordan Davis is one of my favorite players in this draft class, hands down, due to 6'6", 340. And they don't make him like this anymore. He doesn't offer a ton in the pass rush department, but he's still better at getting pressure than most human beings at this size. And imagine how much he could open things up for Joey Bosa and company. Maybe, just maybe even Jerry Tillery has a late breakout with a contract track here coming up, playing alongside a guy like Davis that's eating up double teams. 
At number 25, we've got the Tennessee Titans, and we won't know who they're targeting in the NFL draft until draft season approaches, and there is a clear first round talent dealing with injuries. And I know he just suffered a torn ACL, but if Caleb Farley ends up working out half as well as Jeffrey Simmons did, then you're gonna start seeing every team in the 20s start taking out flyers on all these injured guys. But the Titans have a small Super Bowl window. It's ultimately determined by the big shoulders of Derrick Henry. As long as he's got tread on the tires, they still got a chance any given Sunday. But to take some pressure off of the running game, I'd love to see the Titans add another pass catcher because they may end up with a little buyer's remorse on that Julio Jones trade. You just can't rely on those old hamstrings of his to allow him to move the way that he's used to. Ryan Tannehill hasn't been as consistent this year because his wide receiving group has not been consistent. Even though tight ends typically take a little while to develop in the passing game, Jalen Wertermeyer could be the answer at tight end for the Titans and for a long time. This guy is built like Antonio Gates and he blocks better than Tim Tebow. Maybe it's the uniform, but I see a lot of Martellus Bennett in his game. He is a big reason that the Aggies were able to take down Alabama and his performances against them have always been impressive. To me, that means he either rises to the competition or he's just on the same level as all the pro talent on Bama's sideline. Either way, this dude is a baller that I would want on my team. At 26, we've got the Kansas City Chiefs, and you know, they're probably gonna end up trading this pick for a veteran that needs a new contract, but just in case they realize that that is not a sustainable team building method, let's have them address the pass rush once again. Georgia's edge rusher, Adam Anderson, is not Frank Clark in more ways than one, and I think that that actually is a good thing. He is going to be a luxury pick for a team that already has a strong roster, but just needs a weapon for getting after the quarterback, because at 230 pounds, he is very undersized, but the Chiefs defense is definitely missing a speed element, and they're gonna need that when they're chasing down quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen. Now, if Steve Spagnuolo is brought back in 2022, he is going to need to update his defensive scheme to keep up with the times. I think that a guy like Adam Anderson would simply force his hand to do so. At number 27, we've got the Dallas Cowboys. I know you thought they were going to be 32, but they're not. But it's another year, another mock, and another reach on a safety for them. They've actually gotten pretty good play out of a few of their safeties this year. Most notably, Javeron Curse, who has bounced around before finding a home at strong safety for the Dallas Cowboys. Dante Casey, Malik Hooker, and Donovan Wilson have all played pretty well and still have potential to make bigger impacts. But unless they are forced to let Randy Gregory walk in free agency, long-term stability at safety continues to be one of their biggest holes. Daxon Hill is one of my favorite true center field safeties in this class so far and would allow J. Ron Curse to continue to play more of that in the box tight end eraser role that he's been thriving in with Dan Quinn. At number 28, we've got the Green Bay Packers, and it's probably going to be the dawn of a new age at quarterback for them in 2022. Devontae Adams could be on his way out the door, so the need for wide receivers in Green Bay goes from 1 to 1A. I mean, if you want Jordan Love to succeed, they're going to need to stop playing games and get some weapons. And enough with these big-ass wide receivers. Let's inject a little quicker gear into this offense with Ohio State's wide receiver 1B, Garrett Wilson. Wilson, he makes it look so easy out there. It's really hard for me to find a flaw in his game. I guess I don't see him as a flat burner, so I can't see him getting drafted much higher than this despite being the wide receiver one on a lot of people's boards i am struggling to find an nfl comparison for him if you've got one please let me know in the comments of who garrett wilson reminds you of but drafting a slot wide receiver like this would give jordan love a safety blanket that could turn check downs into touchdowns while also allowing randall cobb to follow aaron Rodgers to denver and hey everybody wins at number 29, we've got the Buffalo Bills, and they have officially replaced the Cardinals as that team that you can pencil in a number two quarterback to play across from their All-Pro, and you can do this on an annual basis until they find one. I mean, I'm cool with it because it just gives me another excuse to bring up Josh Norman getting stiff-armed into the Astral Realm. Teron Johnson has been a really good nickel cornerback for them, but Cincinnati's Mod Gardner offers that size that you're looking for. At number 30, we've got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and assuming Tom Brady just never retires, I'm going to keep throwing assets at the defense to get them back to that Super Bowl form. Ohio State's Zach Harrison is a lot beefier than Joe Tryon Shoyenka, and I think that if he continued to bulk up, he could play the five tech in this defense and eventually replace Ndamukong Sue next year, but this team still lists Anthony Nelson as a linebacker, so I could be way off here. At number 31, we've got the Baltimore Ravens, and the Ravens got lucky that the Steelers wanted to officially have the worst offensive line in the league and allowed Alejandro Villanueva to play right tackle for their division rivals. While he's technically signed through 2022, he is a band-aid at best, and the Ravens should reinforce this offensive line early on in April. NC State's left tackle, Iki Aquanu, has been starting at left tackle for the Wolfpack since his freshman year, but I believe that he could fill multiple voids for the Ravens, and he is the Rashawn Slater of this draft class for me. Even though it's, you know, unlikely that he even comes close to recreating Slater's rookie season so far. Even in the best of scenarios, I think it's the level of intelligence that he plays with, the stature, and the general consensus that he is likely a interior offensive lineman at the next level. But sometimes all it takes is one team, or maybe even just takes one practice for a guy to show that he does belong at the tackle position, and maybe he could play right tackle for them. I used to be in the group, let's be honest, I still probably am, but in the group that thought you could just lump together some of the elite offensive tackles in a draft class and plug them in on either side. But after seeing the difference in Penny Sewell from right tackle 
tackle to left tackle, it makes me reconsider everything. However, Iki Aquanu is definitely not as big. Not many people are, but he also isn't coming off of a year away from football. So who knows? I know that scouting offensive linemen is probably easily my weakest position group. So let's stop talking about linemen and let's finish this mock draft off. At number 32, we have got the Arizona Cardinals. This is definitely the first time I've ever done a mock with the Cardinals picking this late. They went all in and set themselves up for a Super Bowl run with this roster, and it's been working out so far. There are a number of positions that they could address where they've been heavily relying on an aging player, but at pick number 31, 32, this is my favorite place to take this position group in a mock draft, especially when the team that's already slated there has a need. And I think that the Cardinals should consider spending a top pick on a legitimate running back to pair with Kyler Murray. Isaiah Spiller is an all around running back, and up until prepping for this mock, I always assumed he was related to former Clemson and Bills running back CJ Spiller. They play the same position, wear the same number, similar running style, even though Isaiah Spiller is definitely not as fast as CJ, but I was just blown away by this new information, and I'm going to compare the two Spillers anyways. CJ was one of the fastest guys you'll ever see on a football field. That's why he went ninth overall to the Bills. Isaiah Spiller is not slow, but he's definitely more sturdily built and could probably have a better NFL career for that reason. Whew, that was a long one guys thank you for bearing with me and being so patient as i finish this mock draft i am sorry that i had to miss out on the week seven pick them for this video but now that i've got it formatted i've got it set up i've got the players in there i should be able to churn one of these out every few weeks until we get to the draft season and i can crank these out with even more information on the players on the teams on the needs all that stuff this is definitely one of my favorite things to do on this channel if not my favorite but they do require a lot of work so once again thank you so much for being patient if you appreciate the amount of work that i put into these do me a favor help support this channel hit that like button Button, subscribe to the channel hit that bell notification I did take the summer off and for some reason I am still struggling to get this thing jump started but hopefully with a really good mock draft turnout here the views on this channel will start rolling in again and let me know what you guys think would you rather have a video like this each week or would you rather me continue doing the pick em videos we are at a crossroads with that let me know what you guys think maybe an every other week approach for the pick em video would be cool but yeah I definitely ran out of time with the Sean Watson news sort of flipping me where I had to basically do two three days worth of work to get these mock drafts done I tried to do it over night so that is the main reason why there was no week seven pick them but i will post an image on the community tab here on this channel for any of those of you watching the next couple days and i guess we'll stay tuned on the deshaun watson stuff and if november 2nd comes and goes and he's not been traded i will do another mock draft here based on the eagles trading for him in the off season all right thank you guys once again so much for liking for watching for commenting subscribing all that good stuff i will see you all in the next video